Welcome to Indus Special. I am Ajaz Heather. The Afghan government and its international military backers killed more civilians in the first three months of 2019 than the Taliban and other insurgent groups, according to a report published by UNAMA, which is the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. This is the first time since the UN began tracking civilian casualties in Afghanistan over a decade ago that pro-government forces have caused a majority of deaths. The U.S. President's Afghanistan Peace Envoy, Zalme Khalilzad, tweeted that he was distressed by reports of civilian casualties. We deeply regret any loss of innocent life during military operations. We never target innocents. While we strive to prevent casualties, a real solution is a ceasefire or reduced violence as we pursue lasting peace. For its part, President Ashraf Ghani's government blames the insurgents for using civilians as human shields and using civilian houses as hideouts and bunkers to fight security forces. Ghani's government has also said it doesn't agree with the report's methodology. Overall, 581 civilians were killed and 1,192 injured in Afghanistan between January and March this year, down nearly a quarter from a year earlier and at the lowest level since 2013. That fall was largely driven by a reduction in suicide attacks, the UN report says. Meanwhile, the intra-Afghan conference that was scheduled to be held in Doha got derailed and it remains to be seen when the issue of numbers of delegates could be sorted out. To discuss this, we have with us Najib Sharifi, who is based in Kabul, uh, James Dorsey, uh, who is an analyst based in Singapore and Ms. L.A. Ishad, who's also based in Kabul and is a parliamentarian. Uh, Mr. Sharifi, what do you think of the UNAMA report? Uh, is this because, as President Ghani's uh, office says, because the insurgents use civilians as human shields, or is it because of the aerial strikes, which have caused many civilian casualties in the past also, and about which uh, former President Hamid Karzai is also on record as having said that these aerial strikes should stop. Well, in my view, it's a combination of both. Um, there's no doubt in the fact that uh, um, yeah, insurgents um, use civilians as a shield uh, to basically protect themselves. And uh, this is one of the features of the insurgency in general. And um, uh, we have had examples, like significant examples of this in the past. But at the same time, I uh, see um, the growing um, a level of, you know, um, attacks, particularly air strikes, which uh, obviously in the context of an insurgency cannot easily distinguish between, um, you know, civilians and insurgents, which is very unfortunate by itself, because... Um, Civilians are civilians, and they deserve to be protected. And they should not be, each side should exercise maximum caution so that civilians are not engaged or so, so we are So we are agreed, so we are agreed that there is no way to be very precise when ground forces call in close air support. For instance, if there is a particular village or part of a town where there is a battle raging between the insurgent forces and the Afghan National Security Forces, and if the uh, Afghan National Security Forces call in an airstrike, then obviously the civilians trapped uh, between the security forces and the, the insurgents, and then if you are attacking them from the air, the chances of civilian casualties get very high. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And that's why I'm reiterating that the very nature of insurgency um, creates the ground for enhanced level of civilian engagement uh, or civilian casualties. Um, this is not a conventional war. Well, well, what I would like to make very clear is that by no way or by means, civilian casualties is acceptable, whether it's the, from the Taliban or from the Afghan government and international forces. Um, and I, I strongly um, you know, recommend that both sides exercise maximum caution about this. But again, uh, if it's, the war is going on in, in a village. Obviously, in that village, civilians are living. And uh, when you, particularly when you look at the terrain in Afghanistan, it's um, 
I find it extremely difficult um, um, that uh, they 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 um, it, they carry out their operations in a way that uh, el- that um, um, that refrains from civilian casualties. Okay. Uh- let me uh, bring in uh, Ms. Ele Ershad. Uh, Ms. Ershad uh, is a parliamentarian. Obviously, you have to go to the people to get votes. Um, and uh, there are, uh, you have your own constituency, like all parliamentarians. Uh, what do people on the ground say about security forces operations? Uh, actually, in Afghanistan, as we all know, the 40 year a proxy war uh, made everyone tired, and especially ordinary people. They need peace and they want peace, no matter what happens and uh, what will be the sacrifice and also the um, steps towards uh, peace. The first request of uh, my constituencies in all Afghans um, uh, and their first wish is ceasefire. And uh, even uh, some uh, women from our wo- women organization, they condemned uh, the um, uh, al fata and also um, Khalid uh, uh, wars. And uh, they condemned it and they said, uh, we want peace and we don't need to be killed uh, anymore. So this is the request of ordinary people and the wish of ordinary people. But what happens in politics uh, sounds a little bit different uh, people who created war in afghanistan now or let me say countries they created war in afghanistan uh, now they have the first hand to uh, take the opportunity um, in this um, regard and then they start to have their own uh, method of uh, bringing peace to afghanistan and ordinary people is not uh, quite happy by the act of America, Russia, and uh, Pakistan, Iran, and even our own our, our own government. People are claiming and they, they uh, uh, think that the system they started to have peace is not working like this. First of all, they, if there is no ceasefire and if we uh, get killed day by day by Taliban, uh, then um, they, they lost the hope and they said uh, it, it's not going to happen that soon and there won't be any peace like this because even the start steps were not uh, appropriate. Okay. Uh, James Dorsey, you uh, keep a close watch on Afghanistan and also the Middle East. Uh, the Afghan National Security Forces have been trained largely by the U.S. and NATO troops. One of the uh, things that the ground forces, NATO ground forces do is because wherever they're operating, they like to uh, have a very clear real time intelligence on the ground, uh, so to speak, you know, eyes in the sky. And they also, if if they get into uh, uh, an extensive sort of intensive firefight, they try to bring in close air support. Now, do you think it's the same kind of thing that the Afghan National Security Forces are doing because they've been trained by them and when they really get into an intensive firefight, they call in close air support and the, the aerial platforms get involved and that is how the civilian casualties hike up? I'm sure that's part of the story. I think basically uh, what you have is an incongruity. No matter how much the United States has adapted on conventional warfare over the last several decades. You remain to have, you, you continue to have a non-conventional force fighting a, basically a conventional force. And that's uh, never worked, frankly. Uh, and, and as a result of that, so, and you see that very much in the calling in of air support. With other words, what you're doing, what the, NATO and the United States, as well as the Afghan military is doing and understandably doing, they are trying to minimize the risk to their own forces, Correct. which means that at the same time you heighten the risk to the other side, including the civilians among the among those that you are targeting. That's a that's a very important point, uh, James, that you're making. But are you also implying here that and of course, I mean, all the militaries do this because Primarily, the commanders want their own forces uh, to not have high casualty, and uh, Afghan National Security Forces already has a very high attrition rate. So that is correct. So the trade-off here is that you make it more costly for the other side. But the problem really is 
that it's not so much the insurgent fighters that get killed because they are trained. Uh, it's, it's the civilians who, who are caught in, in the crossfire uh, that are going to, uh, you know, basically uh, get the brunt of uh, the aerial platforms. Absolutely. And I have no doubt that the U.S. forces, the NATO forces, and the Afghan uh, military will are seeking to minimize to the degree possible the number of civilian casualties. The problem with it is you cannot, you cannot evade it. And therefore, as long as you're fighting the war this way, and you have to fight the war this way because you have to protect your own people, both because uh, uh, otherwise your, the, the morale in your own military is going to go down, but also for domestic political reasons. But nonetheless, you have this dichotomy that's almost not soluble. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is of the dilemma. But Najib Sharifi, uh, the thing with the insurgent forces obviously is that they would want to increase the cost for uh, the other side, whether it is uh, a it's the government forces or whether in this case, as they call them, the, the occupation forces uh, that invaded and occupied Afghanistan. And one way of doing that, of course, is to uh, create situations where there will be high casualties among the population and then use that to recruit people because people will get disgruntled. They will uh, think that their government is incapable of providing them security. And then, of course, that is the, the tipping point where some of them will break ranks and go and join the insurgent forces. So this is a dilemma, as we have uh, you know, determined. But it is also something where the cost for the government is much higher than it is for the insurgent force. I um, absolutely agree with you. Um, um, the Taliban in the past, uh, well, in the past um, two decades, particularly in the past couple of years, because they have been trying to uh, portray themselves as a more of a kind of like a political entity. They have been trying to undermine the legitimacy of the government. And one of the very effective and successful means to do that um, uh, is to basically um, uh, create situations where the um, civilian casualties goes up. And this not only helps them with uh, expanding and enhancing their military ranks, but also undermining the legitimacy of the opposing forces, which is the government, uh, Afghan government, and to some extent international forces. So uh, that's why the um, um, Afghan National Security Forces and International Forces need to um, exercise maximum caution because both the military and the political um, uh, cost of um, any mistake that results in significant uh, civilian casualties is huge. Absolutely. There, I, uh, there is another aspect of this, uh, if I recall, uh, there was a report about how, uh, especially in the initial uh, period of the, the war in Afghanistan, where because of tribal and local enmities, uh, people would report uh, to the uh, NATO ISAF forces about those that they wanted to get eliminated. And uh, those were the days when, um, because of this flawed intelligence, uh, or shall I say the slanted intelligence, uh, lots of operations were launched that ended up ki killing many civilians, including uh, you know, that famous incident where uh, a wedding uh, party was, was attacked and killed. So th that kind of thing is still going on, or has that been finally put to an end? Well, as far as I've seen, there has been significant improvement in um, many ways. Um, um, for example, one of the kind of like very, very notorious um, trends that we had in the beginning was what exactly you outlined was because people were uh, tribes because of their, you know, like uh, competition or enmity that they have had in the past um, used flawed or planted flawed intelligence, you know, um, among the, the American and coalition forces. Um, 
uh, so that they basically avenge, you know, their competitors or their enemies. So to a large extent, those kind of flaws that we, we experienced in the past has, uh, you know, uh, been fixed. There is also one other aspect that we need to keep in mind, uh, which is right now much of the airstrike is um, conducted by Afghan forces these days. And the kind of like technical skills and um, knowledge that obviously the uh, coalition forces have in regards to determining location and uh, launching air strikes. The Afghan forces do not possess uh, the, the, the skill set uh, to effectively and accurately engage targets. However, they have been much, much more intelligent in terms of um, understanding local dynamics and um, local factors that could contribute to flawed intelligence um, and uh, to, to basically evade that. Um, so, but I, um, again, I believe that um, the uh, level of uh, casualties of civilians is going to continue on high levels. Um, analysts, both sides, take very, very radical measures um, to um, reduce the uh, level of civilian casualties. Again, it's just because of the complicated nature of insurgency, because um, both sides use this, one uses uses it to undermine the legitimacy of the other side, and the other side uh, basically um, engages in extensive air strikes to reduce their own casualties. Um, the trend, unfortunately, in my view, will continue. Uh, it will continue, but it, this is very interesting um, that the, uh, the, the statement uh, that is being put out by Zabiullah Mujahid, which kind of uh, corresponds with the UNAMA report. And this is about uh, the UNAMA head, uh, Mr. Yamamoto, meeting with Mullah Brother. And the statement says the extensive discussions, which were also attended by some members of the negotiation team of Islamic Emirate and the political office revolved around the ongoing peace process, civilian casualties and humanitarian aid in areas of the Islamic Emirate. Respected Mullah Baradar Akhund encouraged the head of UNAMA and his delegation to strictly adhere to the principles of impartiality in such issues and to appropriately discharge their responsibilities in the discussed arenas. Now, Mr. Sharif, this is superb public relations. Won't you agree? Because it signals two things. One, that there are areas under the Islamic Emirate and two, that the Islamic Emirate is very concerned about the issue of civilian casualties and wants UNAMA to be active in terms of recording them and also in terms of performing uh, its assistance mission. Wouldn't you agree with that? It's indeed, I said, uh, brilliant public relations. And uh, Taliban, we have to admit, admit, they have performed very well in terms of um, public relations, particularly in the last, um, year, um, um, you know. However, what we uh, what's extremely evident is that, um, as reports show, a significant amount of civilian casualties have taken place by the Taliban and their cronies in the past um, 18 years that uh, we in Afghanistan have been experiencing um, war or another round of war um so it's um so uh, it, it, uh, it it really is brilliant literally and the Taliban have performed um i have to admit um um very smart public relations as compared to um uh what the afghan government and international supporters um do um however important this stage um, both sides exercise um, uh, very, very effective um, protocols or methods so that civilian casualties come to uh, a minimum level. Um, this is because um, the cost of war in the past 17 years has been extremely heavy on the civilians. 
Absolutely. And, um, Absolutely. Um, uh, James Dorsey, uh, we were talking about uh, the cost here and the fact that, as I uh, said, the Taliban statement, which uh, very nicely corresponds with the Yanama report uh, and signals two things which I think is brilliant public relations strategy. Uh, Najib Sharifi also agrees with that. Um, what do you make of the statement which uh, has been put out by the Taliban and which kind of corresponds, as I said, with the UNAMA report? Uh, uh, a couple of things. First of all, yes, of course, it's a smart move. Uh, it's all the more a smart move, uh, given that the report says that there have been less suicide bombings, with other words, less casualties on the part, uh, on the, on the, or caused by the insurgents. Having said that, it's also one in one is two. I mean, this is kicking into an open goal. You're taking advantage of the fact that for the first time, uh, the, uh, the burden of civilian casualties is on the other side. I want to come back to something uh, that we were discussing before, and that is that the uh, increase in civilian casualties automatically is an advantage to the insurgents. And I don't know that that is true. First of all, the insurgents, it depends from area to area uh, with, uh, uh, which areas we're talking about, but the insurgents have to rely on some degree of popular support in the areas where they operate. Uh, when the casualties go up and the casualties are caused by either NATO forces, U.S. forces, or the Afghan military, there are two options. One option is that the population blames the attacker, which would be the most logical one. But what you often see is that ultimately parts of the population blame the insurgents. Their, their mere presence there being what, what attracts uh, the aerial strike. That's so a very that's a very interesting very interesting um, thought, James Dorsey. Um, I uh, I'm afraid uh, this is all the time I have for this segment. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Najib Sharifi, James Dorsey, Ms. L. A. Irshad. We will uh, now take a short break and at the other end of the break discuss provocative actions by Israeli government and settlers that continue to cause tensions in Jerusalem and Gaza. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. Some 300 Israeli settlers stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. The settlers carried out a provocative tour of the mosque and made repeated attempts to perform Jewish rituals inside the Muslim holy site. This provocation comes at a time when Israeli voters, voters have once again voted in the right-wing government of Benjamin Netanyahu, who is pro-settlements and believes that using brute force in the occupied territories is the only solution to the Palestinian problem. His son was recently mocked for suggesting that Palestine never existed. To discuss the situation, we have with us Dr. Ghazi Ham, who is a former deputy foreign minister based in Gaza, and Dr. Basim Naim, who is a spokesperson for Hamas. Uh, let me begin uh, with Dr. Hamad. Dr. Hamad, once again, Netanyahu is in the driver's seat, and we know how he deals with the Palestinian dispute. Now, now that he is back, do you think the situation is going to get worse, or is there a possibility that there could be some kind of breakthrough? First of all, you know now that the general policies adopted by the, the uh, Israel government uh, up now, maybe just before some decades, uh, now they decided uh, for the special uh, points for the, uh, the Israel security and the politics uh, regarding the expanding settlements, building more settlements. Uh, this is maybe one of the, their priority. They now want to keep Jerusalem as a capital of Israel. And uh, in this thing, I think Israelis are trying every day in order to afford and to uh, dismantle the political process. They want to destroy what's called the two-year solution. And they want to remove the, the Palestinian cause from the table. 
uh, they are supported by the Americans, are supported sometimes by some European countries, and uh, sometimes they are with the Arab uh, science. So I think there, there will be no change in the Israeli policy, but I think they will try to make more aggression, more aggressive uh, measures uh, on the ground regarding building settlements, expanding settlements, now to Judaize uh, Jerusalem to be as a capital of Israel, and also to remove everything related to the Palestinian cause from the table of the negotiation. Uh, and I think maybe that after that, Israel will try to market themselves as, as a country in the Middle East. Uh, they want to, to be normalized. They want to be part of the region. I think this will be the, the, the one of the, main, the major priority of Israel. And I think uh, the United States will try to help them in order to market Israel among the other countries. Okay. Uh, Dr. Basuk Naim, uh, this is a very in, uh, interesting and very important point uh, that Dr. Ghazi Hamad referred to. So the Israeli strategy seems to be to uh, essentially reach out to the Arab countries. Uh, we saw uh, the kind of uh, diplomatic offensive that they launched uh, and they want the Arab countries to accept them. And simultaneously, they want to keep up the repression uh, in the occupied territories. Uh, do you think that this is a policy which is succeeding, obviously to the extreme detriment of the Palestinian cause? Thank you very much. First of all, I have to emphasize the point Dr. Hamad raised at the beginning that the Israeli strategies and policies and plans uh, are fixed and uh, uh, they are not so much affected by repeat by different Israeli governments, right or left. We will reach the same uh, points at the end. Uh, maybe we have tactical differences, but uh, strategically they have the same uh, goals. Uh, second, regarding your question, the Israelis are trying since 70 years to be part of this region and to normalize their relationship with the other uh, with the Arabic countries without paying the price for this uh, for the stability and peace in the region. The price is to solve the Palestinian question by giving the Palestinian the minimum of their rights of independence, freedom and uh, dignity. And they don't want to do this. Therefore, they want to solve the problem on the cost of other uh, people. Uh, practically, they have they were succeed, successful in uh, making some breakthrough with some Arabic, but it is only at the official levels. We are we here. We are following the situation closely. Uh, we know that the people on the ground in different Arabic in, the, in all Arabic countries, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Egypt, and other countries are totally against these policies. And we can take well, only one example. Uh, in 1979, uh, Israel signed an, a peace agreement with the Egyptians, and they have, uh, you know, they have all the chances to normalize their relationship with the, with Egypt and with the Egyptian people. We see that there are officially a relationship between Egypt and Israel, but on the ground there is a total rejection of the of the Egyptian people to this uh, uh, foreign uh, body in the area especially as long as they are not ready to pay the price for peace and stability, which is, uh, as we said, the minimum of the Palestinian rights. Uh, second, uh, instead of uh, moving more and more toward uh, peace in the region uh, and uh, giving the or, or creating the conditions and the, and the environment to to solve the problem, they are shifting more and more every day towards the, to, towards the right and towards more fanatical and more racist uh, policies, uh, not only against Palestinians, against Palestinians and against Arabs in general uh, in the region. Okay, so one of the actions from the Israeli side with reference to Hamas is that Hamas uh, provokes Israeli security forces by uh, launching rockets from Gaza. Now, what is the the reality uh, of that? Uh, last time uh, this incident happened, Hamas said that this was an individual who did this and there was no institutional authority with that individual. So, could you please clarify what the issue of 
uh, launching rockets from Gaza really is? First of all, we have to go back a step. Uh, we have to go a step backward. Uh, the root of all uh, provocations and all violence and all terrorism in the region is the presence of the occupation. Gaza Strip, as the rest of the Palestinian territory, according to the international law, is occupied by, the, by Israel. And the Palestinians have all the right to uh, defend themselves and to struggle for their freedom and for their independence by all means, peaceful and non-peaceful means. And this is, guarant this is uh, guaranteed by the international law, by the way. Correct. Uh, therefore, we don't consider any struggle, including armed struggle, as a provocation. The provocation, the real provocation, is the presence of the occupation. Second, Gaza especially, I mean, uh, in, when we talk about Gaza in, in especially, Gaza is besieged for more than 12 years now. Gaza is prevented from contacting the outside world. Uh, movement is forbidden. Uh, medicine, water, electricity, uh, the, the basic rights of a human being here is not uh, guaranteed for the two, 2 million people inside Gaza, where the international community considered this as a, a collective punishment and as a, a, a crime against humanity. This is not our judgment. This is the judgment of the international community, including the last uh, Human Council report issued in, uh, in, uh, in, in March, which considered Israel committed war crimes against Palestinians in Gaza and against two million Palestinians in general who, who is besieged here for more than 12 years. Therefore, we don't talk about provocation from Gaza. Regarding is it uh, uh, accredited or not accredited the last yani, la rocket launched against Israel, this is part of the understanding between the uh, Palestinians here in Gaza and the uh, Israeli authorities uh, through the UN and the Egyptian delegations to keep uh, quiet uh, on both sides of the border in order to ease the life of Palestinians here and in order to give a chance to lift the siege uh, step by step. Dr. Ghazi Hamad, one of the ways of moving it forward uh, was obviously, uh, you know, the Palestinians governing themselves in their areas, uh, the, the, you know, essentially the two-state uh, solution, and then the right of uh, uh, return for the refugees and the stopping of settlements, Israeli settlements. Now, we have seen that on all counts, uh, there has been no forward movement at all, and it, see, it does not seem that any government under Netanyahu, and of course, I, I agree with what you said, that it's not, it's not about the right and the left, because at the end of the day, uh, they are all the same. Yet, uh, as far as the left governments were concerned, there was at least some kind of sophistication in terms of keeping the peace uh, you know, uh, movement forward. Now, of course, there is total stalemate. And this stalemate is going to result, as you also said earlier, uh, in getting in, you know, uh, the situation getting worse. Look, I think now everything is clear. Nothing is hidden. Uh, now Israel uh, is speak loudly and frankly that they are not interested in Palestine. They are not interested in any political statement. They are just uh, believe in uh, Israel as a state for the sovereignty, the uh, uh, power of powerful of Israel. So I think now they don't take care about what's called the peace process, uh, uh, political negotiation with, with the Palestinians. They try now out to destroy everything by uh, saying or by practicing. Now by saying, I think that so many times he said that that uh, there will not be a Palestinian state. He will not go back to the uh, borders of six events. He will not allow for the right of return. He will not uh, give up of Jerusalem as capital of Israel. Uh, so I think um, uh, now they are uh, they are uh, also at the same time they are practicing on the ground by taking the lands of the Palestinians, uh, uh, turning the West Bank to the isolated cantons, uh, impose siege on Gaza. So I think practically they destroy what's called the Oslo Agreement, which was signed in 1993. I think now the problem that that the, the Palestinians created by the 
uh, Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. He still believes that Israel wants peace. So he's waiting and waiting for many years, for many decades, but now he's, he's getting a big deal. Uh, I think in the same time, the international community now is keeping silent. They are dealing with Israel as, as a spoiled boy, as a, a state of above of law. Uh, they let Israel to do everything, to kill the Palestinians, to build settlements, to uh, put a checkpoint everywhere, uh, to take the lands of the Palestinians, and they are doing nothing. This is the problem of the, of the world. It's the problem of the international community. So they, they are now sometimes focused to, uh, to put sanctions on Iran, sanctions on Sudan, sanctions on different countries, but they let Israel do what they want. This is Obviously, the because, uh, because Israel is the blue-eyed strategic partner of the United States, I'm also joined by Dr. Khalid Kazumi, who is a spokesperson for Hamas, Iran chapter. He joins us from Tehran. Dr. Kazumi, thank you for uh, being on the program. Uh, we're discussing the fact that with Netanyahu again in the driver's seat and given that he's pro-settlements, given that he believes that brute force can actually resolve the, the issue, plus he also thinks that through a diplomatic offensive, he will be able to win over at least uh, at the government-to-government -government level uh, various uh, Arab governments in the region. So all of this essentially adds up to the fact that we're going to look, uh, see the situation getting worse for the Palestinians. And it does not seem to me that there's any viable strategy at the moment with the Palestinians which can get the international community to be to side with the Palestinians and oppose Israeli policies. Uh, uh, greetings to you, uh, your audience and your guests. Um, talking about strategy with the Palestinian. Uh, it seems to me, as a Palestinian, that there is no strategy from the enemy sides and, and allies to solve the Palestinian issue since the beginning. They always have tried to liquidate the issue of Palestine in favor of the Israeli enemy. Uh, if, if you talk about the international community, you can count hundreds of resolutions which has been passed by the United Nations against Israel, and nothing has been implemented. If you talk about the the regional or or or, or, or the, the in, in the region, any 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 organization in the region at the level of OIC, Arab League, they have passed a lot of resolutions against Israel. But you found at at, at the end of the of, of, at the end that there is really um, sort of. Uh, alliance with the enemy. I mean, there is nothing relevant, really, if you cut deep to the grassroots of, 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 the, of our issue, if you cut deep to that, you will not find any real strategy which target, which is the target of, of, of justice. Dr. Dr. Kadumi, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you, and I hear you loud and clear uh, what you're saying. But here's the thing. So Israel is, as I said, a blue-eyed strategic partner of the United States. It's militarily the most powerful state in the Middle East. Uh, the Palestinians have tried everything. They tried armed struggle. They also tried to make peace with Israel. Nothing has really worked. And if there is also no strategy on the Palestinian side or the, uh, the, the Arab states, then what is the way forward? I mean, it, it can't just be a, a, a military solution, and we also don't see a diplomatic solution in sight. Does that mean the Palestinians will have to continue to suffer? Uh, and they've been suffering for more than seven decades now. Actually, it's, it's not that uh, clear the way, uh, I mean, if you, if, you, uh, if you pardon me, if the way you have described it. We have two models uh, till now in front of us. One is the resistance and one is the negotiation. Let us have some uh, quick uh, uh, review to the both of them. You will find that the resistance has achieved a lot. Today, because we in resistance movement has believed to move forward in a holistic approach of resistance that tackles the military aspect, the political aspect, the diplomatic aspect, you will find that we have incurred the enemy a lot of losses, and we have achieved also a lot of gains. Today, we have a little strip on the sea called Gaza Strip is without Israelis over there, and that is because 
simply the pressure by the resistance, economic-wise and security-wise, over the Israeli enemy. If we have really proceed further with the same thing, look at us in the United Nations today, the people in America even, they are there to speak against Israel. The, the white men in Europe, they are talking about the security threat of, of Israel over the world, how they have destabilized the situation in the whole region. So it's, not, it's no more that, it, you, you, that we can say that we didn't achieve anything. No, we have achieved. No, I, 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 let, me, go, let, me, let, me, let me clarify. Uh, I did not mean to say that the Palestinians have achieved nothing. Uh, I think they have achieved uh, quite a lot. As a matter of fact, there are lots of European, Western European countries now that today uh, understand the Palestinian dispute and the issue much better than they did 10 years or 20 years or 30 years ago. So, so yes, there have been gains. But my point was and is that given the, the fanaticism that has brought Netanyahu back into power, uh, the situation is likely to get worse and one does not really see any breakthrough or any kind of space for negotiations. That, that, that was my point. No, yeah, I understand how you, if you allow me just only for a few seconds, I'll explain it further. I agree 100% with you that this program of, 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 of settlement with the Israelis the patch up with the Israelis increase the dichotomy between the, the, the nations and the official level, how they are felt in love with the, with the Israeli enemy. And for us as Palestinians, we have decided to face this enemy and also to call our friends, our brothers of, uh, in, in Arab Muslim countries and freedom uh, and, 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 and free voices in the world to be with us in this caravan for justice. We have achieved some. We will achieve more, and through one strategy is resistance. And resistance is not like that when you finish your bullet, you go home. No, it's a holistic approach of resistance. You do it the military, which is the backbone of our resistance, because Israeli enemy only understand, as you have said beautifully, that the fanatism in the Israeli society today is selecting or electing the one who kills Palestinian more. So this is their choice to face us, in a different way. We have nothing to lose because we are on our land. We have the solidarity of our own people. The revolution, the resistance, sorry, has achieved more than any other program. So, so our nation today is seeing the salvation in this way. So they are proceeding further and we will gain more. Again and again, I'm saying that we will continue with our political, diplomatic, and military resistance against this enemy. Because this enemy cannot reach to any compromise with him. Because he doesn't want to give anything. He wants to get more. In, in, in the past, he used to do it through the tank. Today, he's doing it through his own proxies in the region. Through, through his own people in the region, through what is called now normalization. And what, uh, what Donald Trump today, the puppet of Israelis, is, is, is saying the, 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 the ultimate deal for, or, or the century deal on the Palestinian issue. Okay. okay. Thank you much, uh, Dr. Khalid Kadumi, Dr. Ghazi Hamad, Dr. Basim Naeem, for giving us your insights into the situation in Gaza as also uh, the issue of uh, Palestinian and Israeli uh, peace deal, uh, the Palestinian armed resistance, and also uh, the effort to uh, negotiate with the Israelis. Uh, that's all from Indus Special this week. Uh, we shall see you next week. Until then, it's goodbye.